Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the privilege that you give us to be here. And as we continue dealing with the subjects, we need, Lord, your Holy Spirit. We need your guidance and the Holy Spirit to open our minds that we may see the truth. Please, Lord, be merciful to us. Forgive our sins that we may receive your promises. That we can also enjoy families that are working for you. That we may heal them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Preparing medical missionary families. One thing I can tell you personally is, when I was studying or going to study at the university, one question was in my mind, Lord, what can I do to serve you best? So, am I going to go into business? Am I going to go into what? When I was doing my last years of high school, I remember they did what we call the application test. You may have heard about the application test. Basically, they test you so they can guide you, counsel you in what line of study you are better on. So they did the test, I passed the test, and then they gave me the result, and they said in the result that I had a high score. And then they said, you can do whatever you want. Now, we recommend you that go into the scientific research, to go into the medical degree or engineering, but you can do whatever you want. I said, that doesn't help much. <laughs> so I have to go back to the Lord and say, Lord, what is the career, the whatever I want to study that will serve you the most? So I wanted to study something that will serve the Lord. And then reading the spirit prophecy, the Bible and so on, I said, hmm, it seems to me that in the medical field there is a lot of work to do at the end of time. So I said, okay, Lord, I would like to be a doctor. So I pray and I study for that and I went for it. But one day, studying about the 11 hour, you remember the 11 hour? 11 hour workers, we know that this message is going to finish, bringing the world to a, an awakening point. But do you know who is going to finish that part of the 11 hours? God says in His Word that it's going to be by the children. Ah. Then my question was, Lord, I'm not going to be a child when that happened. I'm already growing. So I'm not going to be part of that. But the question is, then is my children the one that are going to be? If my children are going to be part of this 11-hour message, the question that comes to me then is, are my children ready for that? And then, who is going to make them ready? Of course, we know that the Lord is the one who is going to make them ready. He's the one who is going to prepare them. But do I play anything in that role? Do I have something to do or to say about the education of my children to prepare them for the 11-hour work when they have to face it? What is the 11-hour work? We know that the last, last, it's going to be the combination of the medical with the evangelism. And that will be, it says there, the only thing that will open the heart of the people. We have been so hard, our hearts will be so dumb, so difficult to reach, so hard, that there will be nothing else that can reach them. Number one, a child. Number two, medical, combined with the health. Therefore, my children have to be ready for that. Now, question. Do you think our children in our church are ready for that? No, they are not. This is honest realization, right? Honesty. They are not. So my question is, what am I going to do? So let's go for that. In this paragraph that we are going to be looking at, <clears throat> there is one thing. LNG White was approached by people because many of the students were looking for what they call the dead languages. What's that? Like Latin, Greek, things that people don't use anymore. Or do you see people talking in Latin and so on? And No, no, we don't actually hear those languages anymore. They are what they call dead languages. Nobody used them. 
Now, what did the people used to study in LNG Wise time, 1860s and so on? Why did they study those languages at that time? Well, they studied because they wanted to learn more about Latin, then maybe uh, review translations, or maybe do some other things. Maybe. But then what did Ellen G. White say about what God basically told her to say about these studies of dead languages? Now think about that. Is it really useful for all our children to be Latin language scholars? No, we don't need so many. Maybe one child could go into that and then say it would be useful for him. God may have called him for reviewing, for example, the Bible. Translations of the Bible. Would that be good? Yeah, maybe. But how many do we need? Maybe not so many, right? Now let's see what God says through the uh, servant that we have, Ellen G. White. So we can see what happens with this topic. So it says there, And a knowledge of Greek and Latin is not needed by many. The study of their languages should be made what? Secondary to a study of those subjects that teach the right use of all the powers of body and mind. So we stop there and say this. If there is one thing that is important for God is this. That the development of a child is complete. If we go into the study of the definition of health, then we can see that our bodies is actually threefold union. And then God is interested in the development of the body as a complete unit. It continues saying, It is fully for students to devote their time to the acquirement of their languages or of, what does it say? Book knowledge in any line. Can you read there? It says, any line to the neglect of what? Training for life practical duties. Now what will you consider a life practical duty? Name me one. Housekeeping. Housekeeping. Very good. Give me another life practical duty. Gardening. Any other one? Cooking. Cooking. Marketing. Now, marketing. Now let me open here something that Sister Vita has just said. In my country, there's not much problem, Panama, with this that I'm telling you. But when I met my queen, who is from Mexico, raised in the Mexican environment, the macho groups, eh? when I met my queen, and I went to her house where she grew up, and I went into the kitchen and cooked, because my mother taught me how to cook since I was nine years old. And I was helping in the house, cleaning and everything in my father-in-law's house. Then Mexicans started to look at me because I was something different. In Mexico, if a man goes in the kitchen and helps in the house, he is... He's gay. Now let me tell you what God says about this. Do you want to know what people say or what God says? When we read about the medical missionary training, God says in, in the book, Helpful Living, that every man should know how to cook. That's God's word. Every man should know how to cook. So is God calling every man to be gay? Is that what you're saying? Mexicans? You see, you understand? According to the world, according to men's standards, we have a view. And people are driven by views. People follow those things. But by God's standard, what is it? Everybody has to know how to cook. Including men. Nothing against ourselves. Right, men? It's a reality. This is God's word. So you see here... It says, a knowledge of any line to the neglect of a training of for life's practical duties. What is God saying here? You can spend all your life studying Greek, Latin, doing all these kind of fancy studies. If you don't study the practical things of life, you have done not what I want. You see the point? So what is more important for God? 
not what is important for men. And we have missed it. That's why you miss. We miss the study for our children in the proper way because we have been following man's standards. Let's continue reading. It says there, What do students carry with them when they leave school? First question. God is asking. Remember that. And he says, what do students, what? Carry with them. Meaning, yeah, you study all these things, and yet, when you go out, it's like if you didn't do anything. Then, next question, it says, where are they going? Have you noticed that when ch children, well, young, young people go to study and all these things, majority of them, when they finish, they say, what should I do now? I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. And they depend on a company, on a business, on an organization to call them and bring them to know what they should do. If nobody tells them what to do, they, like, they don't have any guidelines. Have you noticed that? Okay, now look at what he says now. Have they the knowledge that will enable them to teach others? Is that interesting? Many people say, oh, I cannot teach people. I know what I study, but I cannot share it. I cannot teach. Mm -mm, that shouldn't be. Because in God's plan, we all have a mission to do. And what is that? We cannot keep it for ourselves. This is what we call witnessing. Have you heard the word witnessing? That is essential for our growing. So if we don't share what we have studied, what we have learned, what we have done, then we're missing. So therefore we have to be prepared for teaching, for sharing what we have learned. Next question. Have they been educated to be true fathers and mothers? Do you understand now? Can you see it? God is saying, if your children go and study all these fancy things, but they don't know how to rule the home, men, or they don't know how to take care of the house, women, I don't see it as good. It's not important for me. What is important in the medical missionary work is that we need to be, or learn to be, mothers and fathers. Is that what happened in our church? At the end of a career, our children, when they finish whatever they had done in a school, can they say, oh, I know how to be a father now? Can they say, I know how to be a mother now? Let me ask you a few questions. So we can see the reality of the problem. What is God's plan? That a child should feed any time he want? Or a child should have a schedule for eating, even breastfeeding? Which one do you think? How many persons do that? You see that? Now let me ask you the next question. How many hours should a child have in between feeding? Do you know that? When the feeding time should be changed from one time to the next one? How do you know if the baby already needs to change from one schedule to the next one? Do you know that? I will cover all those questions in one of my topics. But then the point is this. This is what God considered more important. Now how many of you consider that you are medical missionaries? All right. Now let me tell you. According to God, we cannot go into medical missionary training people or helping if we don't know these things. Because if we want the church to know these things, and we want to teach the church, 
what medical missionary work is, and we don't know how to do the practical duties of life. Do you think we are medical missionaries? We are not. So where should we start? We need to start from the basics. If we want to have medical missionary families, we have to start from the basics. I'll give you an example. I have a patient, he comes to me and he says, I have a daughter and she's coughing. And Kevin, my nine-year-old, comes and says, Daddy, charcoal. And I say, yes, that's a good one. And then my Kayla comes and says, Daddy, calamansi on the nose. How do they know? by experience. Why? Because they work with me. They are my helpers. And they are learning the practical things of life right along everything else. Do you think they are bothered by studying? No. They are happy studying. I'll give you another example. One day we were on the beach. We were living in Dinalongan close to Valer area, you know that area? We spent there many months, actually a year and so on. And then when we were going to pick up things from the area, some people gathered and said, we are gonna eat together because we were gathering our things and then we will let you go. So we went to the beach area, we prepare food and everything. And then when we finished eating, I said to Kayla, you go and wash the dishes. So she gathered all the dishes and she went running to wash the dishes. But there were like three ladies in the, uh, you know, washing dishes area. And then she asked permission and she went in to wash the dishes. They left, they went out like this. And they let her wash the dishes. And they observed what she was doing. And they saw that Kayla was washing the dishes gladly. And she was singing scripture songs. And she was washing the dishes like nothing else. And then I came by because I wanted to get something from where she was washing. And then they told me, the sister told me, she knows how to wash. And she's only six years old. And I said, sure. She looked like she's a mother. And I said, praise God. That is medical missionary work. You want to see it? We will see it. And then he says, can they stand at the head of a family as a wise instructors? This is medical missionary work. Let me give you another experience of myself so we can understand this a little more in detail. When I was six years old, my mother and my father became Adventists. At eight years old, I wanted to be a deacon. You know what a deacon is, right? Then they said, mm, you cannot because you're too young, but we'll give you probation time. We'll let you follow us. You will be part of our deacons as an observer. If we see that you want to you do it well, then we will put you on board fully. So I said, sure. And then I started. All my life been deacon, elder of the church. All my life. I'm actually an elder, ordained elder. Then, when I was doing my deacon work, they asked me to be an elder. And I said, it's impossible. I cannot be. They said, but we need someone to help us, and you have been doing a good job, so we have to put you on board. We need an, an elder. I said, but I cannot do it. Why not? Do you know why I couldn't? He has no role model. Huh? He has no role model. Yeah, I have no role model. Do I have a wife? I didn't at that time. What does the Bible say about the elder? He should be a husband of? How many wives? Ah, one, okay. Yeah, you know the Bible. <laughs> Do I have a wife? No, I don't have a wife. So should I be an elder? No, I shouldn't. And then it says, what else? What else does it say in the Bible about the elder? It says, husband of one wife and that he knows how to rule because if not, he will not know how to rule the church. Now, what is God saying there? 
We cannot expect to have healthy churches if we don't have healthy homes. And for that means, men, we need to know how to rule the home. You see the point? Then I said, I cannot be. But they said, we need you. And I said, well, look, because you did said so, I will help, but I cannot consider myself even an elder. I said, sure. And I went to be an elder, and I helped my church in everything I could, being an elder, but I knew in my heart I was not an elder yet. Then when I married, and I was having my house, then I said, I can be an elder. I was not actually an elder at that, at that moment because I was a missionary in Guyana and I was busy doing so many things. I was not an elder at that moment. But later I went back into the elder thing and became an elder again. And I've been an elder all the time. But then was when I was able to say that now I can be an elder. I was married and by God's grace, I hope, I can be contributing to the church and to my home in the proper way. But let me tell you, the honest thing is this. I forced myself, not that I didn't want to do it, I purpose in my heart, I should say. Before I married, I told you already, I read Child Guidance three times before I married. You know that book? I read The Adventist Home two times before I married. I read Mind, Character and Personality, the volume one, two times. Volume two, two times also, so it's four books. Four books. And I read them before I married. Why? Because I wanted to make sure that I knew what to do when I was going to be a father. Today, if I see someone, one of my students or my friends that says, I want to marry, I always tell them, tell them this. You don't have my blessing if you don't read at least once these four books. Child Guidance. Adventist Home, Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 1 and 2. At least one. Now let me tell you a true story testimony so you can see this. I was at UG Pines. And two of my students finished. And they were working. And they knew what I always tell about this. And he, won, he went by me and he said, I want to marry this person. And I said, have you done your task work, your homework? He said, no. I said, son, you know me. You cannot have my blessing. Please do that before you go into the marriage. He left. And I was in his wedding. I even sang for his wedding. And I prayed for him. Six months later, he came to me. And he said, crying, I want to divorce. From then on, he came to me twice, thrice, four times, crying, crying, and crying because he wanted to divorce. And I told him, no, let's pray and keep fighting. So I guided him in whatever knowledge I had, and I tried to help him in whatever I had in the ability. So he didn't. And up to now, he didn't. Although I don't know how things are right now because I'm not there and we have not had good communication from then on because I came to the Philippines. But the point is, we need to prepare our children for this. This is not a play thing. And God needs families that are healthy for him to finish the work. Can we have medical missionary families if we don't train them in proper way? No, we cannot. If we don't have children, sons, boys that do not know how to rule the home, how can they rule the church? If we don't have mothers that know how to be in the home submissive and to rule the home in the way it should be, how can we have healthy churches? We cannot. Look what it says. The only education worthy of the name is that which leads young men and young women to be Christ-like, which feeds them to bear life's responsibility, feeds them to stand at the head of their 
families. Such an education is not to be acquired by study of hidden classics. Now, is that saying that Dr. Boutte is saying that should not be going into medical school anybody? Is that saying that nobody should go and study marketing? Is that saying that no, no students, no, none of your children should be going to nursing or architectural degrees? No, that's not the way. The point is this, we have focus in saying, just like my mother, I never blame my mother. I never blame my mother. I love her and I never murmur for what she did. But the reality is the reality. She knew this model of society. She followed it. But one day I learned and I said, I'm not going to follow that anymore. And then she told me when I was a child, you're going to study, you're going to be the first in class. She's a retired teacher. So she made me what she wanted. She actually said one day, I want pilots and doctors in my house. And yes, all my brothers, two brothers, they are all nurses. I'm a nurse too. I studied pilot also. I didn't finish, but I did. My brother, the older one, he is a controller for the towers. She basically made it. Now, is that what the focus should be? No. That shouldn't be the focus. I'll put it in the reverse. God's plan is this. You focus in Christ's character. Number one. You focus in life's responsibilities that children know what to do. That they participate in the home duties. That they know the practical things of life. They should train for one trade at least before. And then after that, they go for something if they need. If God calls them for that. How is that? Let me explain this a little more. One day, when Kevin was three years old, I was reading in the Bible, in Genesis, the story about Isaac. When you read Genesis, you can see that Isaac was a win, and Abraham did a feast. Have you read that in the Bible? Any of you have read that in the Bible? Okay, you read it. He made a feast when Isaac was going to be win. Question. Why Isaac was having a feast? Or why Abraham made a feast because his child was going to be win? You know what win means? Out of the breast, not breastfeeding anymore. Tapus na? Now, solid foods. Dutas. Dutas. Lutas. Lutas. Then, the question is, why no more lutas? Why a feast? A party? Have we, do we do that today? We don't do that today. It will be nonsense. You listen, Dr. Boutet is inviting everyone because he's going to have a party because his son is going to be win. Can you see that? Now, let me ask you a question, because that came to my mind. Why? Why did Abraham do this? At that time, I thought, my best resource right now, I was in the U.S., my best resource right now is to write a letter to Amazing Fact. You know Amazing Fact? is the mother of, or father of, Pafco, you know about Pafco, Philippines Adventist, Amazing Fact, School of Evangelism. Well, I wrote to the main um, office there in, in California, and I asked them the question, why did Abraham make a feast for Isaac's winning process? And they came the answer, and the answer was this. In the old Israel, there was a custom of making or doing a feast when the child was going to be weaned at three years old. And then they said, that it was a custom because it will be the first solid food. Question. That's the Jewish tradition following what? God's plan, right? Isn't that? Question. 
Why three years of breastfeeding, no solid food, until the third year? Any doctor here? Any nurses in here? You may not agree with me, but in my career, in my experience, what I have learned, it is definitely better if the children wait longer for solid foods. I never knew from science that three years should be the best. I never. You can talk to anybody, any doctor, any nurse. They will not tell you that three years is the best. Yet, what does the Bible say? You see the point? What do we follow? What do we know about standards? What do we know about rules and guidelines? Do we know them? Then one day, my queen, we were at the zoo in Atlanta, Georgia, and she saw a Jewish lady because she was raised and a custom of the Jewish, and she ran to ask her a question. And she said, When do you win, children? And she said, at three years old. Can you imagine? 2000. We are ready in 2000. We are not in the old time. 2000. And she still says that they win children when? And she said, yes, that's the custom. Why we don't do that? Have you heard of that before? No. If we talk about leaky gut's disease, you may understand why I am now more inclined into the three years of breastfeeding. Now, we'll have to cover many other things, medically speaking, so we can understand this issue. But the point is this. I'll continue with the answer of amazing fact. They said, at that time, the child was weaned. He was going to start one meal, solid meal, from then on, and no more breast anymore. So they will make a feast. And then it said, they said, continue saying in the answer of the question, a baby was considered before that time, and he was considered a child when he would be five years old. In the Jewish tradition, a child was considered a child at five years old. My Kevin is three. Now, look at this. The child was to be with his mother until five years old, at least. After five, the child was going to start going with his father to learn a trade. And he should have learned one trade before 12 years old. At 12 years old, the child was considered a man. If he do not know one trade, that was considered a sin from his father. A what? From who? The child? No, it was whose responsibility? The father. And he was called what? A man at 12 years old. This is Jewish tradition. Did you know the, all these things before? I didn't, so I know you don't. Most of us, we don't know these things. You never heard it. The question is why? Why? That question always come to my mind. Why? I wanted to know. So, I started thinking, what am I going to do? What is more important for the Lord that my child is a doctor that he learns a trade? Ah, you see? Let me put, put it in another way. This is normal society, right? This is normal society. In society, if you have a child and you want them to be studying and so on, people say, I'm going to make a bank account. I'm going to save some money. When my child is ready for going to college, I will give them this account so they can just get money from the account and they can have a study. This is what people dream to do. Many people cannot do it because there's many things they need to do and they don't have the money for that. And they cannot save the money. But many people dream that they can have a bank account, something that the child can have to make the studies that they need or they want. Isn't that so? What does God say about that? He says, no, don't do that. He said, teach them one trade and let them work for their studies. Do you know that? 
Which standard do we follow? Which method do we follow? God's commandments? Or the commandments of men? You see the picture now? Do we have medical missionary families ready for this work? We don't. Look at this. True one? True education is one. Missionary training. You want your families to be medical missionary trained? We need to have what in the home? True education. True education. You are already looking into what true education means. You have been hearing about the true education. Sister Teresa is going into that deeper knowledge of the true education. What is true education for God? And we have to have that in our homes. I don't know if Sister Teresa has talked about the 10 principles of true education already, but the 10 principles of true education is part of the materials that Sunlight covers. It's a very long material that it's very beautiful. But when my queen and I, we decided to go through this journey of learning the true education, we talked to Sister Teresa right there at Uchi Pines and we asked her how we could do this. And she offered it to us. It was so beautiful, so selfishless, I mean uh, unselfish for her, from her part. She said, I will come every Sunday to your home and we will study for one hour. What time you think is better for you? And, she, and we said, five o'clock in the morning, 5 a.m. For one year, whole year, every Sunday, we were there in my house. She came to my house, five o'clock in the morning, for one hour, every Sunday, one year. And we went through the whole 10 principles of true education. We will read through the week. On Sunday, we will do review. We will discuss things that were needed to be discussed things that we didn't know properly, we had to discuss with her, and she guided our study for one year. And that was a very, very beautiful thing. And we went through the True Education program. And I hope you can do that, because it's very important. Now it says here, True Education is missionary training. Every son and daughter of God is called to be what? How many? How many SDAs are called to be missionaries? Everyone is called to be a missionary. Why? Because we have to share the blessing that God has given us in our lives. We cannot keep it for ourselves. But then what is the mission field? Practical duties of life. Practical duties of life. We'll continue pondering in these thoughts so we can see how important this is. And it says there, we are called to the service of God and our fellow men and to feed us for what? This service should be the object of our education. Now question, is this the object of the education that our children are receiving? Is this the object of education our children are receiving? No. Let me be honest with you. Honest. I told you already, I know in the U.S. there is an Adventist school that Harry Potter's book is the textbook. Nothing against my church. This is clear. This is reality. But when we knew that the Bible was not allowed in the school and they followed this rule from the U.S. government, I said, do you think I'm going to put my child in this school? I never put my children in the U.S. school. Now, some people say here in the Philippines, oh, people that don't know, of course. People come, oh, your, their children are in school. I said, yes, they're in school. So did they go to uh, the, which school? Say, at home. Ah, home school, what's that? Mm -mm. So what do they learn? Well, they are in school, they learn this and they learn that. And they said, but, but what about reading? And what about mathematics? And what about... What is the program that God has for our children? Do we know all the curriculum? When does children have to start studying? Example, when a child should be allowed to read for the first time. When? That God, God has any guidelines about that? Yes, He does. My children, from what I know and I have read, are not allowed to read 
until they are, do you know? Eight years old, at least. This is God's guidelines. Now, question. So, do I allow Kevin, for example, before to read the Bible? No, I never allow him to read the Bible. Now, do we say, oh, that's wrong. No, wait a minute. They are not allowed to read the Bible, but I will read it to them every day since he was in the womb. Every day. And he has memorized chapters of the Bible. Before eight years old, even baby, when he was able to speak already. But why? Because I read it to them. I made him repeat and he learned them. But did I allow him to have a Bible to read? No. My Kayla, she's six, uh, six, six years old. Do I allow her to read the Bible? No. She's not allowed. She has her Bible? Yes, she has her Bible. But she knows she cannot read it. Why? Because God said so. God said it. There should be no textbooks before 8 to 10 years. That's God's word. No reading before that. Why? Well, I can explain you med medically speaking. Why now? Because you understand now. But that's not the point. The point is God gives us a guideline. We should follow it. Yes or no? Do we know these things? You see, this is the point. When you get the manual that God has given us, Child Guidance, Adventist Home, Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 1 and 2, at least, then you have the thing for the home, how to rule it. There may be some other books you may say, or somebody else may say, but let me tell you, in my experience, this is it. This is the package that I can tell you. You should have it at home and you should have read it. Now, let me tell you this. Many people agree with me. I have found people that have not done it, and they married, and they said, I don't have time. That's always I said, people, you have to do it before you marry. Once you're married, you don't have time. So when are we going to prepare our children to be parents? After they have children? You see the point? So when should we have schools for parents? This is the first one. You understand now a little more? Why we have you here in this camp meeting? The family Bible camp is a necessity for all the world. But here in the Philippines, we said we need it here. We are going to pray for that. And praise God, we have it today. And of course, we cannot do the whole thing in a few days. But at least we have to start somewhere. You have to give you the interest of what to do and a little guideline so you can start. Start reading these four books. And do it now. And if you're married already, you have to do it anyhow. You have to take time for that. Because we need to learn. Let me give you some answers so you can see. A child should not feed, breastfeed, less than two hours at least. Should not eat anything in less than two hours. The regular schedule should be two hours in between a feeding. That's according to God's word in the spirit of prophecy. He says it. And he says, no child should eat unless regular intervals. You have to have the schedule. Not in between meals. Because if he allows that, he will be breaking his own law where it says we should not eat anything in between meals. Now you have the answer, right? I'll cover a little more of that when I, ho I have that presentation so you can see. All the work we do that is necessary to be done be it washing dishes, setting tables, waiting upon the sick, cooking or washing, is of moral, moral... What is moral? It has to be with our character. Moral. Now, look what it says after. The humble task before us are to be taken up by someone. And those who do them should feel that they are doing what? A necessary and honorable work and that in their mission. Washing dishes a missionary field? Oh, yes. So are my children in the mission field? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. But there is a difference. Why? Because look that it plays an importance on the attitude. 
And this is the important part. Look at Humble though it may be, they are doing the work of God just as surely as was who? Gabriel. You know who Gabriel is? The main angel in heaven? That means if my children are washing the dishes right now, then after lunch, they are doing the work as Gabriel when he came to talk to the prophet? So why if parents say that children should not be in the kitchen? Who are we following? Commandments of God or commandments of men? Then it says, Just as surely as was Gabriel when sent to the prophets, all are working in their order in their respective spheres. Woman in her home, mothers... Mothers assigned to who? To what? To do what, mothers? Children at home. It says, woman in her home, doing the simple duties of life that must be done, can and should exhibit what? Faithfulness. Then what? Obedience. What else? Love as sincere as angels in their sphere. Is that the way our children behave? Or express themselves when doing these chores at home. It's not just doing it. It's not just put, putting a child and wash the dishes. But they have to do it how? Obediently. Lovingly. Cheerfully. That's the important thing. And it says, Conformity to the will of God makes any work honorable that must be done. <clears throat> now he says, In Adventist home, Children and youth should be missionaries at home by doing those things that need to be done and that someone must do. You can prove by faithful performance of the little things that seem to you unimportant that you have a true missionary spirit. It is the willingness to do the duties that lie in your path to relieve your overburdened mother that will prove you worthy of being entrusted in larger responsibilities. Now, pay attention to this. God is saying here that He will not use our children. You see the point? He will not use our children for greater work if they were not faithful in the small duties at home. Now, brothers and sisters, let me put it this way. Are we preparing our children to do the greatest responsibility God wants to use them in? You see the point? Look at the world. Look at all the families. Are our children prepared to take in their shoulders the responsibilities that God wants to give them in the future? Are they ready? No. The problem is, who has the responsibility to do this? The children? No. It's who? The parents. But do we know how to do it? Ah, you see? It says, do you not think that washing dishes is pleasant work? Now look what it says. Yet. You would not like to be denied the privilege of eating food that has been placed on those dishes, right? This is God speaking. Huh? This is God speaking. And then it says, Do you think that it's more pleasant work for your mother to do those things than it is for you? Brothers and sisters, I saw this in my own house with my mother and my brothers. And up to the sun of today, I can see the damage in my family. I have chosen a different route. And I will never regret it. I will never. It says here, <clears throat> Do you think that it is more pleasant work for your mother to do those things that it is for you? Are you willing to leave what you consider a disagreeable task for your careworn mother to do while you play the lady? 
There is sweeping to be done, there are rocks to take up and shake, and the rooms are to be put in order. And while you are neglecting to do these things, it is, is it consistent for you to desire a larger responsibilities? Can you see the importance here that God plays in these things? Is God joking? He's talking seriously. This is the problem. Now, what is the solution? <clears throat> Have you considered how many times mother has to attend to all these household duties while you are excused to attend school or amuse yourself? So we have areas that we have to consider when we talk about the families to be able to do medical missionary work. Let me give you an example of what we do at home so you can see. Because I had the blessing, of course it's a blessing, I did nursing and I did medical school also. I even did medical school 10 years basically, more than what anybody would do because I did it almost twice. Why? Because I had to leave medical school because of the Sabbath. They forced me to resign from my university because I was dumb. They said, you are crazy. You cannot continue with the Sabbath issue. So you have to resign. Otherwise, you will be like if you fail the whole thing. So I resigned. Made a letter at the Panamanian University. The state university. Then I left. I finished nursing at that time. And then I went back. to the, I went to the mission field. Guyana, when I met my queen. And right when we married, then I found a university there in Guyana, actually, that allowed me to have Sabbaths off, no problem. And then I did my medical degree. I had rotations to do in the U.S., so I finished my rotations in the U.S., and they graduated in the U.S. But that was a blessing, because I had that opportunity. Now, there are many things I am unlearning that I want to forget from my training. But the anatomy and physiology, that was a good thing. And then I use it now for my children. So what I do is this. For example, in the morning when we read the Bible, and I told you that, for example, if we talk about the eye, for the eye of the Lord are over the righteous, and his children are under his care. Then I talk about the eye. So I talk in the morning, I bring my anatomy books, and I talk about the eye, how the eye functions, the liquids that are in the eyes, the cells that are in the eyes, the importance of everything how it is made, and everything on the eyes, morning and evening. And sometimes I cover diseases, for example, if you have a, a boil, if you have something that's stuck on your eye, what do you do? What do you use if someone is peeling coconut and a piece cuts in the eye? What would you use? Then I tell them, just get tawa tawa. You know tawa tawa? Just get tawa tawa, cut it, put the white liquid on the eye, Every day, three times a day or four times a day, keep doing it until the peace come out. No problem, not even a scar on the cornea. I have done it for myself. So it's not that, oh, I made it in somebody. I did it myself. My queen helped me because I was, I was cutting coconut to make copra, you know copra? So I did it, cracking and one piece went to my eye. And then I was feeling a little discomfort, and I said, hmm, it doesn't look good. It looks like if it's glaucoma, symptoms of glaucoma. I said, it cannot be. I'm following God's plan. What's this? And then I realized, I went to the mirror, and I said, oh, I have something on my eyes. Of course, I cannot see myself, right? But I tried, and I finally was able to see that I had a piece in my eye. So I did it for myself. I asked my queen to put Tawa Tawa every day. And in a few days, no problem. Of course, at the moment, I have pressure on my eyes. I was tearing all the time. It was red, irritated, and it was inflamed, of course. And I had all the idea that I was having glaucoma. I said, no, this is, cannot be. But thank God it wasn't. And then I teach them. I teach them what to do. They are along in the training. They know what to do here in the Philippines too. Because they need to know. So someone comes with a problem. They know. Last week, somebody from the community came with a cut in the leg and an arm that was swollen. And my children knew what to do. They know already. How, how, how old is my Kevin? Nine years old. Kayla, six years old. They know what to do. Essential things of life. Do they know how to cook? They cook by themselves already. My Kayla's already six years old. She beat me. 
Because I learned when I was nine. She's already six. She's still six and she learned how to cook. She knows how to cook by herself. She has done it. She knows how to wash. They all wash their clothes at home. They all know how to make a fire. They all know how to sweep the, and, and get the house ready. They all know the duties of home. Now the question is this. Do they enjoy it? Or they do it grudgingly and murmuring. They enjoy it. This is the important point. That they said, Daddy, how may I help you? Go and cut the onions. Shoo. I'm going there. Willing heart is what God wants. That's what we need to have in our children now. Not children that you tell them, go and do this. Because they want to go and play with something else. No, that's not the way. Isn't that what is happening in our world today? Are we getting them ready for medical missionary work? And we haven't finished. There are other areas we have to see in the home. I'm just covering you few. So now let's see what are the areas that I always tell people we have to cover in the family so we can be <clears throat> doing the medical missionary work. Number one, health. You have to make sure the habits of health are not only taught to the children. You teach the children, but that we practice them. Why? This is the point. You remember that in the Bible, when Jesus spake, when he taught, people heard him and they said, Oh, no man has spoken as he has done. Is he learned? Why did they say that? Because they thought, hey, he didn't go to school. He didn't go to Harvard school. Yet, he speak with power. Why Jesus spake with power? Do you know? Well, I encourage you, go to the Spirit of Prophecy and read the expansion of the explanation of that phrase in the Spirit of Prophecy. And you will find that it says there that Jesus spake as with power because he was practicing what he taught. Number one in the medical missionary work. You can never do medical missionary work if you don't practice what you teach. Therefore at home, I go on board with my children. Things that have to be done in the home, they learn it and they have to practice it. I'll give you an example. One of the lessons that Spirit Prophecy says that teachers should be always reminding the students to do is proper posture and proper breathing. Now, if one time I can teach you about proper breathing, that would be nice. 90% of the people breathe through the mouth. Wrong. 90%. Yes, even you. I can see it. I know it. Now, the problem is I teach it and people still do wrong. What is the point here? We cannot be medical missionary work. We cannot have families to do medical missionary work if we don't practice what we teach. So every day we are, pre we are in the worship time, we are talking to each other. I always remind my children their posture and their breathing through the nose, not through the mouth. Now I can teach you why, medically speaking, so you know why God made the nose for that, not the mouth. But I will have to do another lecture on that. That is not the point right now. But I am on top of my children. Breathe through the nose. They are speaking to me. Remember to breathe through your nose. Remember to breathe through your nose. You are singing. You are speaking. You have to use your nose, not your mouth. Then my little Kirk, Kayla, they said, well, Daddy, I just ate, but I want to go to lay down. I said, no. What does God say about that? Not to lay down after a meal. All right. Consistency. Consistency. You cannot teach others and do something else. So health must be practiced at home. It must be a habit in us to do what we teach at home. Can we be health reformers and teach people health reform if we don't do it at home? Can that happen? Well, it happens because many people do it, but it will not be powerful. It will not be powerful. Only will be 
powerful when it happens. Give you an example. One day I was teaching the, the patients at the Lifestyle Center at UG Pines. And I was telling them the benefit of garlic and how garlic is good for the, you know, cancer and so on. And then they said, no, but that, we cannot do that. We cannot eat garlic. I said, wait. And I got my computer and I put the video where my two-year-old is eating steamed garlic, my Kayla. And then one of the patients said, how much do you pay your child for that video? <laughs> I pray because I didn't know what to say. And right along, another patient said, you cannot buy a two-year-old with money. If she ate it, it's because she liked it. I said, praise God, she, he had the answer that I didn't have. <laughs> but that's true. You don't buy a two-year-old. If they like it, they eat it. If they don't, they will not, right? They will speed it up, exactly. So, in the same way, at home we practice what we preach. Everything that we say, we practice it. We practice it, we practice it. That's the way this message is going to be powerful. That's the way they are going to be ready for the 11 hour time. Do you think a child can teach health reform to the people now, if we have to be cut off from them, if they don't practice it? God says never eat anything in between meals, not even a morsel, not even an almond. Nothing should be placed between five hours, one meal to the next one. So if you have a breakfast at eight, 7 o'clock, you shouldn't be eating anything until 12 o'clock. Nothing. If my child do that, he has to ask for forgiveness of sin at night. And I have to punish them for that. And I have done it once for one of them. Never again. Only once for my three children. Can it be done? It can be done. Now the problem is we don't know how to do it and we have to learn. It is possible. This is just examples of what the family has to go through. The number one is health. All the health principles that God has for us need to be followed. I'll give you another example. One day we were going to sleep and I noticed that Kevin, my little one, covered his head when he was going to sleep. And I said, Kevin, whoa, no, don't do that. He said, what daddy? Don't cover your head when you sleep. God says in the spirit of prophecy that should never be done. No child should be allowed to sleep with their head covered because it will be detrimental for their health. I didn't explain him anything. I just told him what God said. And he said, okay, daddy. Never done it again. Can it be done? It can be done. But we have to make sure we understand as parents our responsibility. Now what happened about me? Do I do it? No, I don't do it either. I never sleep with my head covered. Breathing, eating, chewing your food. So I go and check the poop. This is reality, brothers and sisters. And then I see Kevin, Kayla, Camille, whatever, whoever. This food was not true. You cannot do that. You have to eat slowly and chew your food. Ah, but sometimes the little one doesn't understand because they don't know what, how to eat and so on. They want to eat just learning to be gluttonous. And then I said, okay, if you're not going to chew the food, then the next meal you don't eat. Do you think he's going to be encouraged? He's going to. And he's willing and he goes and he checks the poop. Make sure that it's good because he doesn't want to skip the meal. And he chew the food. Can it be done? It can be done. Next point, what is it? Mind. Psalm 103, 1 says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Now, why do I bring this to point? 
When I was doing my nursing career in the U.S., I was working with the health department of Tennessee, part-time nurse. And I found a document from the American Pediatric Association. And it said, 2009, it was saying that we should not allow any children below two years old to be in front of any screen. Hmm. Did you see what I'm reading in my mind in the bulletin from the American Pediatric Association? What does it say? We should not allow any child below two years old to be in front of any screen. Any screen? What does that mean? Do you know what does that mean? Now the question is why? Do you have that question in your mind now? Okay, I had the same question in my mind. Now they didn't say anything else. They did not focus on anything else. They just said it. But why? So I started searching myself. And then I found some of the things that why this is happening. I actually printed the document and gave it to my uh, boss because at the place that I was working, they used to have a big screen similar to this one in front of the children there in the waiting area. So I said, hey, this is what the Pediatric Association is saying. And we have this TV here. We are not following the guidelines. And they just put it aside. They didn't follow what I said. They just forget about it. This is the way it is sometimes. People just hear it, but they don't do anything. I was not going to be the same way. So I investigated myself, and then I see what was going on. Now, put it this way. Somebody comes and takes a picture of my son, let's say with an iPad, and he comes and shows the picture to my son, and my son do this. And he thinks my child is rude. Why? Because in my house, one of the rules is they are not allowed to see iPads, phones, or TVs. Now, the person may think that my child is rude, yet he is what? Obeying his father. He's just following what I said he needs to do. So they know, if I'm working on my Mac, they go around. If mommy is using her iPad, they go around. Because they know. Now, let me tell you why. In my research, I found that screens are made for 32. We have some people with media here, they may know more than I do, but they can probably tell you more if you want to talk to them. But the idea is the screens are made for 32 frames per second, right? How many frames can our brain handle? We are made to capture approximately eight frames per second. That means the stimulation of the eye is greater when you are in a TV. Now what the problem with that is? The problem with that is that when you have overstimulation of the eye in the brain, the brain does not develop. Now you don't have a brain that is developing maybe right now because you're an adult, but what about the children that the brain are developing? TVs, screen, it doesn't matter what is in the screen. It doesn't matter if it's Jesus' movie in the screen. The screens are made by 32 frames per second and your eye only can capture 8 frames per second. Therefore, we call it overstimulation of the brain. Overstimulation of the brain will cause a decrease in brain development. You see the picture now? Now the question is this. The American Pediatric Association says that the brain, the children should not be in front of any screen below what year? Two years old. Now question, when is the brain stopped developing? When does the brain development stop? Finish. When? Do you know? All right. Mainly in medicine, we say seven years old. Mainly, but that's not completely. Why? 
because the brain still continues a little bit in the development until well let me explain this anatomically first so you can understand you have sutures you know what sutures are when you are born you are only fontanella just the space that you can touch and it's bumpy right because very soft because there's no bone in there there's no bone there's a space so the head can squeeze and the baby come out of the birth canal right when we grow these things turn into a skull gets bigger and then we have the skull or the cranium the bone then gets together in a place that is called suture just like a suture a stitching and then it gets sealed sealed don't forget that sealing when we are 24 years old why 24 because our brain finished developing around 22 years of age which area of our brain is the last one in developing that finishes last in developing do you know frontal lobe is that an important place for the lord that is where i want my kevin to have the shekinah glory right there in the frontal lobe am i making a sanctuary in my kevin that god may dwell in him where is the sanctuary in the desert in the frontal lobe in our bodies let them make me a sanctuary was the request of Jesus in the old time and it's the same today. Make your children a sanctuary that I may dwell on them. And what is that? The frontal lobe. And where does it finish? 22 years old. Now let me tell you honestly, don't ask me when I am going to allow my children to see TVs, screens and so on. I don't know. I'm honest. I don't know everything. But one thing I tell you, did Jesus need it? Do you think it was essential for Jesus to have an iPad? Be honest. Did he need that to be a child of God? To have the learning that he needed. Is that essential? It's not essential, therefore my children don't need it. Now, when? I don't know. I haven't answered that question yet. I will not be able to tell you. Even in my house, I don't know when I'm going to do it. But this is the knowledge I have acquired. This is my medical background. This is what I have studied myself. So I will practice it. You study. You see if you want to follow it. That's your choice. But what I have learned, I follow it. And my children don't miss it. We have other areas to do. There are many things to study. There are many things to do at home. They don't miss it. They don't need it. They don't use it. I personally don't like to spend so much time in my computer. I try to do it when I don't have to be with my children. Why? Because I prefer to be with my children in the school with them than here. <clears throat> and the Lord has helped me to do that. Now you see, health what else mind is our minds held are our minds healthy are our minds for the lord ready to the gospel to the missionary work that we need to do are we preparing the family for the medical missionary work and this is just one aspect this is just one example how many more you want to talk about sugar and the effect of sugar in the brain we can have a whole lecture about that, about sugar effect on the brain. What about the uh, chicherias? The effect of them in the brain. And as I tell you, the point is that we have to practice what we preach. One day when I was 20 years old, I realized that in my teeth I had 16 amalgams. 
16 mercury fillings, the silver color ones. Why? Because sadly, my mother didn't know these things and she did not put me to control into the amount of sugar I ate, the sweets, the candies, and all these things. And then I learned, even before I met my queen, because you know my queen is a dentist. Before I even met her, I used to brush my teeth, I used to floss my teeth, and I used to, I stopped eating chewing gum, candies, and all that. Because I knew this was the enemy on my teeth. And I said, I don't want to get old and not have my teeth. And I thank God I have my 32 teeth. But one day I had to change even the mercury. Why? What does God say about mercury? It's poisonous to our body. Even until the last particle of it. So is it something God wants us to have in our body? No. So I said one day, I'll take them out. And I took them out. I have now white resins in my mouth. I still have my teeth, but I take care of them. How? One way, I never ate candies again. I promised and I did a covenant with the Lord, I would never eat candies again. Guess what? My children never done it. They don't even know what a candy is. But, Kevin is nine years old. He does not have any problem in his teeth. He has all his teeth. Never have to go to any dentist to have a teeth pulling. Of course, my wife is a dentist, so not a problem either. But she knows what the problem is, and she can tell you her own testimony, even being a dentist, because of the carelessness of our parents. Not because I blame them, because this is a reality. This is our world. This is where we live. This is what we learn. But then one day I said, not for me, not for my children. And I said, no, no more candies, no more chewing gums off completely and that's what we practice at home one day a lady came and gave her gave them a candy and they just saw it and said like in their minds what am i going to do with this they started just you know pushing it up and down because they don't know what to do with it they don't know it and of course now they don't desire it even when we talk about the issue they don't want it because they grow already. I don't want something that hurts my body and damage my relationship with the Lord. This is the way it is. And we pray for us, for each other. Because we know we have to have a mind that is under control. Sugar produces MSG in our brain. Any delinquent behavior could be traced to a problem in the diet. Most of the delinquency in the U.S. now has been traced to problems in the diet. And we'll talk about that later in my next presentation tomorrow. Healthy homes. So wait for that. Mind. The, the, yes. When we eat sugar, produces MSG in our brain. You know what MSG is? Monosodium glutamate? Monosodium glutamate. MSG basically is Vegin, Ajinomoto. Those are the company names. And I have a whole topic about that when I talk about hypertension. It's hidden in the products in the U.S., not here in the Philippines. I even have a picture of these peanut, hot peanuts that you find in the 7-Eleven. It has MSG, monosodium glutamate. It is written in the ingredients. It is not illegal here in the Philippines to see it in the packages. Muscovado sugar? Well, that is a whole topic in itself and I may not be able to cover it. And we'll have another time for question and answers. But just to be kind to you, the Muscovado sugar, the idea is that they make Muscovado sugar from molasses and um, the refined sugar. It's a combination of both. The problem with it is it's still not nutritional, nutritionally high. It's still low in nutrition. But we'll have to talk about nutrition so we can understand this. Amount of nutrients and so on. So we can talk about muscovado. It is not the healthiest thing in the world. And the more we give sugar to our children, the worse it will be. And we'll have to talk about what moderation means, amount of sugar, and what an amount of sugar people eat today in comparison to the old time. You will be astonished. But that's not my topic today. This is just example of things we have to consider when we talk about medical missionary work. One day, I'll give you an example of my own home. 
my own because always I use my home. I'm not talking about your home, somebody's home. My home. <clears throat> One day I was working at the lifestyle center there in the US and I went I wake I came back home for lunch time and my queen told me, you know I had an issue with obedience today with the children. It was really hard. So I said, okay, <clears throat> first thing I want to know is what the children ate for breakfast. And I did ask the question because I left breakfast before they had finished, so I didn't know what was the whole thing for them. So she told me that she gave them dates. You know what dates is? It's a fruit that is like, like a palm tree and it gives a sweet fruit. And if you dehydrate it, it's even sweeter, called dates. <clears throat> and in the U.S. you get it very easily. They sell it. And then I asked them how many. Then she told me the amount and I said, I think you gave them too many. I just said, would you mind giving them less the next time? And then I told her how many. And then it stops. What is the problem? Just by giving them too much of something, they should not be having too much. It could be detrimental for their spiritual battles of the day. We will see that tomorrow as I touch more about the health of the family. We will see that tomorrow. Because it's important. Even these things can be detrimental for our children's spiritual battles. When we wake up, do we know the spiritual battles of our children? Are we putting them ready to face them and overcome the battles of the day? Is that more important for us or that they learn mathematics? You see where the point comes? <clears throat> what is true education? We have to learn what true education is so we can refocus our mind in what is real, what is God's guidance. What is important for him? Next point, because time is running. It says, body. <clears throat> In the same paragraph, where God says the children should not be reading until they are between 8 to 10 years old. Adventist Home, Child Guidance, and some other books, even education talks about the point. It says that even though the child may reach the age of reading, 8 years old, to 10 years old. Still, you have to wait if the physical constitution is properly well so he can start doing this kind of education. Meaning, if they are not still healthy enough, physically speaking, that their body is able to stand the schooling part of the book readings or learning, they should not even start. Do we have that in our schools today? That if someone sees a child that is not able to stand it, that they say, no, you shouldn't start reading and doing all these things. Do we have that? We don't have that. Children go to school no matter what. Now, let me tell you, in here may not be the case, but there are even countries in Europe, I know because I have friends that live in these Europe countries. They are now requiring children to be in school from three and a half years requirement they have to go from house to a school and stay there almost whole day from seven o'clock to three o'clock in the afternoon what year three and a half what is god's guidelines you heard sister teresa where the children have to be up to eight to ten years old in the open field where does he say open field that's why the house that we build in Quirino is an open house. We have an open, uh, uh, you know, floor at the top, and the bottom is like this. No walls. We have an extension kitchen there. I'll show you the pictures. Why? Because we want to follow God's plan, even in the building of the homes. But we need it. It's necessary. But I can see the blessing. Let me tell you one blessing. Kevin, I call him my mold detector. My mold detector. Why? He comes to your home and he knows if you have mold in your house. Because he starts having issues in his nose. 
Now, I'm not so sensitive to mold, but he is. So if I go somewhere, you invite me, or I come here, and I go there, or there, or whatever, I know if you have mold. We were sleeping even in one of the houses while we were waiting for building our house there in Quirino. And he had issues, nights after nights, sometimes even two, three nights, and he had issues with his nose. Of course, we have to talk about intolerance to food and some of the things that we may need to consider. But the point is that at that moment, he was still having issues. We finished the house. Well, not finished completely, but we moved to the house. It's all already livable. We could be there with all some inconvenience and not having a CR and so on. But we, went, we managed and we moved. Guess what? No more problems. But why? We want to follow God's plan for building a home. Do you know God's plan for building a home? What are the guidelines that God has for building a home? Do you know them? Have you read them? Well, this is what we wanted. We read them and we are following. We are trying to follow God's plan for everything. Education, work, recreation, everything. That's why my ministry is called God's plan ministry. Everything we do has to be God's guideline. Now, but in our homes, you see, it's open. We have several windows in the open. We don't have even curtains in the room. Why? Because we want the air and the sun come in. I bought the um, windows that have the glass that is not ultraviolet proof. Why? I will have to give you the whole lecture about sun benefits so you can understand why I bought not ultraviolet proof glass. Details, details, details. But for the Lord, are important. And it's not the greatest things, all oh, magic things, magic things, magic that. No, 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 no. God see the details, the little details of our lives. In the character building of our children, in the education of our children, we need that. We need in every aspect of our life. What is the next one? Spirit. Spirit. What about the music? Can we be medical missionaries listening to any kind of music? I even changed the ringtones of our phones, my queen and I, if I have bought any phone with scripture songs or songs that we know they are good. And we carry earplugs wherever we go. Why? Because we cannot be playing with these things. We cannot be playing. And I don't want to give you bad testimonies about these things. Because I don't want to encourage anybody to do those things. But the important is that we have been slave of problems in our lives and music is one of them. Even myself, I told you, I used to be a romantic listener. And romantic music is a problem in our church today. We have it in the church. I can prove it to you. That's not the point today. It's not my lecture today. But it's a problem in the church. And we have to grow that out. <coughs> Medical missionary work involves everything. And we have to learn about music and scrutinize everything that we listen. Because it's not going to be pleasing to the Lord. Do you know that God says that there are places that He does not visit there are homes and there are churches where He is not. Do we want God in our churches? Do we want God in our homes? Well, we may be shutting Him out with the things that we do. So we better be careful what we do, including music. And I can tell you testimony about myself in this aspect. And I told you already, we did a fast in one day. On music. Three months, no music whatsoever. Because we knew there was something in our music that was not pleasing to him. Then we studied again. We re-listened to them and we said, this is not pleasing to God. Out. What is the next? Education. Well, we talk about that. This is one of the main points in education. What do we do? 
But we have to be careful how we allow our children to be educated. Now remember that education does not come only from books. Education not only comes from the things that we do at home, the duties, right? Education also comes from all their sources. This is the reason why when I teach about education for the family that I tell people, you must be here. Even if you are 10 years old, even if you are 70 years old, or even if you are any age, even if you are a man, even if you are a lady, even if you are married, or even if you are not married. Why? I'll give you an example. One day I was with my children um, in the home, and then a lady came to our homes, and she said that she was going to take Kevin like the horsey, you know, put herself on the floor and put Kevin on the back, so running him like a horse. But Kayla was approximately one year old, not able to walk, you know, stumbling and still, and not able to walk properly. And I said to Kayla, Kayla, you cannot go on top of her back. This is my order. This is a command. This is the law. I made the law. They must obey it, right? Okay. I was brushing my teeth, and I made a mistake myself that I came to the CR area, bathroom area, and I was going to rinse my toothbrush. And for that span of time, which was very close to where I was standing with them, I came back, and guess who was on her back? Kayla was on her back. She had taken her, and she had placed Kayla on her back. Question, what did she just taught my daughter? Disobedient to who, sister? To the Father in heaven. Not to me, brothers and sisters. She just taught disobedience to the Father in heaven. Is that what we want for our children? Education comes in every aspect of our life. Are we there to guard our children in, even in their temptations? And what are they going to be going through? Are we prepared for that? Is that what we do? Are we teaching our church members, our young people, to make sure they understand these things before they marry? Now, I say this because people say, oh, I am, let's say, 50 years old. I passed my age already. Yes, but you, you are an influence for somebody else. You are an influence for another child. A gem for the kingdom of heaven. If there is something I do that will decrease the education of a child, I have accountability in heaven, and I have to face that. You see that? Are we ready for that? Yeah, you may not be read, married. You may not have a child, a child. Yet, you have to be account for whatever you do in front of any child. What am I teaching with my behavior to other children around me? Do they see how I walk? Do they see how I behave? If I do things grudgingly, murmuring? Huh? Everything that we do affects, influence somebody else. So we must be careful in what we do. We must be careful. Next one. Before we finish, the time is running. Work, 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 work. Everything that we do in work, we have said it already, needs to be glorifying to the Lord. Sometimes we glorify things that should not be glorified. I'll give you an example so you can see. Medically speaking, eh? this is just science. I'm not going to take anything else. <clears throat> How many of you think that playing basketball is a good thing for your body? Don't raise your hand if you don't want. How many of you think that being an athlete is a good thing to exercise for your body? You don't have to raise your hand if you don't want. But let me ask you a question. You think you were raising your hand why? Because you believe what society says? Now let me ask you a question. How many of you think that doing exercise like cycling, volleyball, basketball is better exercise than walking? Don't raise your hand if you don't want to. How many of you think that walking is better than the other ones? <laughs> According to our society, and this is the reality, this is the reality. According to our society, if you are a basketball player, if you are 
an athlete, if you are all these sports, you are healthier than anything or anybody that only walks. Yes or no? That's what society thinks. Now let me put it to you in the reality. I have the slide even from the magazine that comes this. Today, science has found that walking and gardening is better exercise than playing basketball. This is science. Now let me bring you back to God. He says the best exercise is walking and gardening. He said it 200 years ago. Now science says, and now we believe it. You see the point? Do we really follow God's guideline in preparing our families to be medical missionaries? All this is part of the medical missionary for the family. We need to know God's guidelines, not man guidelines. So when our children say, oh, daddy, I want to, oh, daddy, I want to, it must be guided in the direction of pleasing God. I know last week a child came to me and said, I went to the missionary school and I learned to dress properly and I wanted to change my lifestyle. I wanted to give my life to the Lord. And when I came home, my father said, you cannot go back to the school. You must go to the university and have a degree because you are nobody. Can you imagine? Where are we going? Where is the importance? Now, remember, I did not say that if you have to study medicine, is something wrong, is a sin? No. But we see our children looking for even the guidelines that God wants, and we are diverting them to go in the way of God. Can you see that? You have to be careful, even ourselves as parents. Next point, recreation. We read it. They are both together in recreation, in work, in association. We, re we will read that when we talk about the topic of Sabbath afternoons. You don't want to miss that. What does God want families to do on the Sabbath afternoon? Don't miss that topic, please. You need to be there. Recreation must be together as a family. It must be enjoyable. And we have to take this in consideration. We will expand that later. Missionary work, of course, we have to teach our children to enjoy the missionary work. And the only way children will learn to enjoy missionary work is if we enjoy the missionary work. And if we are doing the missionary work. And we put them with us in the missionary work. And I have seen it over and over with missionary friends that put their children into the mission work. Of course, mission work can be broad and broad and broad, and we have all these ideas that foreign missionary work is the best thing in the world, but we will see what God says even about that. What is the greatest missionary work? We will see as we study more and more. I am not going to cover the whole thing today. It's just an entrance of what is going to be. I want to finish this with this text, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, and it says, and the very God of peace sanctify you one, holy, and I pray God your whole one, spirit, and soul, and body, be preserved, oh sorry, be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you can see here that even though the World Health Organization in 1946 has given us already the definition of health. God gave it to us many, many years ago in the Bible. You know that the World Health Organization has a definition of health, right? You know the definition of health? All right, well, it's very similar to what the Bible says. It is not only the absence of disease, but the complete... Um, what is the word? Uh, the complete work of the three, body, mind, and spirit. So we know it, even from the Bible, many years before. We don't have to depend on science to know these things. 
God gave it to us and we have it. If we want medical missionary families that know God guide, not that we know God's guidelines for our families to be missionaries and you want that for your family, please stand with me as we pray for that. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we know and we recognize that our world does not have the answer for our families. We have seen, we have experienced in our homes that we don't have what we need so our children can be what they are to be. Please, Lord, save us from ourselves. Save us from the society that has taught us to look at men as the greatest thing. And teach us, Lord, to see you as the guideline for everything we do for our children including all the areas of our family, that we may honor you and bless humanity, which are the two main reasons of our creation. Honor you and bless humanity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.